This is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, August 24th, 2023. It is very nice to see you all. Uh, today we have a mission, which I will explain in a moment when a few more people have shown up. <clears throat> but we've got Ken, we've got Kevin, we've got Klaus, we've got Pei, we are got Stacy, we are we are on a roll. Um, And uh, today we're going to be more purposeful than our often wandering into collapse and doom conversations. Um, I, we put it upon ourselves two weeks ago to do some homework and look at uh, the literature around both collapse and renewal, revival, revitalization. Uh, I think that the preponderance of, of work that we are pointing to is doom-ish, crisis-ish, uh, and what causes civilizational collapse. But I'm eager to see where we go and Hi. very, very open to suggestions for how to frame the conversation, where to go, uh, and uh, what we might do. I'm also really interested in... Um, having artifacts uh, left and made available. I'm hearing some ambient noise from somebody's open mic. Um, and I'm really eager to hear, uh, Kevin, it might be noise near you. It might be Rosalie. Because um, your little rectangle just lit up for me. Thank you. Uh, and so um, the idea of where do we put our notes? How do we annotate? What do we do? Kevin on the list this morning said, hey, should we separate these books into categories and all that? We could tag them up. We could do a bunch of things. So uh, Pete uh, moved the documents out of the Google Doc. He sort of deprecated the Google Doc we started with and moved them into a web page, uh, which is just a markdown file, but also a spreadsheet. And uh, Pete is not on the call yet. I'm thinking and hoping he will join us because he will be uh, happy to see what's going on here. Um, so let me pause for a second and see anybody's thoughts before we dive in and uh, how you'd like to go about doing this. One me... question. <clears throat> I added a couple books on the spreadsheet and I'm wondering when they will be uh, updated to the Google Doc list of books. That is a very good question that only one human being can answer. And he's and, not here. <laughs> and he's not in the call right yet. So as soon as Pete shows up, we'll, we'll ask him. Um, but thank you. Thanks for adding books. That's uh, that's a great thing. Uh, Ken, go ahead. I just want to say, if you want to add books, please go to the sheet, add them, and then Pete will go through and, and drop them into the, uh, uh, the Mattermost file. And we will put links to both of those in the chat here. I'm just sort of just and if you can keep up with the format and please provide a link to the Goodreads site so that people can see reviews of it, that would also be very helpful. So Pete hasn't, doesn't have to go out and do that. Cool. Um, any other thoughts, any other questions, any other uh, ponderings before we yeah, start? I have, I have one. Please. Um, been working a lot with this idea of facticity, which is facticity is what we assess to be not open to change. And then we make these assessments on what's not open to change, and that determines our mood of there's a possibility here or there's possibility is closed off. And when it comes to collapse and climate, facticity is very, very hard to nail down because you can find all kinds of predictions that say, oh, my God, it's terrible. You can find people saying it's not a problem at all. You can find people saying it is a problem, but it's not as bad as you think it is. So it's really challenging to figure out where do you land in terms of what you're going to consider to be valid. So um, in my world, we look for what we call grounded assessment. Someone can back up with some data, but we have to recognize that we're working with such complexity that no one actually knows. So it's really important as we look at things to recognize if I make an assessment that things are, are too far gone and there's no point, then that's going to predispose me to certain moods of resentment and, and um, resignation and why should I bother versus somebody who looks at it and says, oh my gosh, it's really serious, but there's things we can do. And they're going to be in a mood of, of wonder and ambition of what can we do. And that's going to affect the way they, inter they interact with the future and create the future with themselves. So I just wanted to frame that as we really don't know, but there is this thing about how we decide that's really important. And so maybe as you're looking through this list and on this call, consider what you're taking to be true as this is not open to change and what you're taking to be true of this is actually changeable and, and we can work with it. 
Um, Ken, I think that's really important as we walk in here. I'm I'm mindful that um, I recently caught up a little bit with Esther Dyson, which made me think about her dad, Freeman Dyson, who is a known skeptic of the current approaches toward climate change and the climate debate. And he's been pretty controversial. He was pretty pretty controversial about that. Uh, and partly he was saying we don't actually understand the mechanisms that that are that are underfoot here that we're busy talking about and making big decisions about. And I can't paraphrase uh, really his his approaches. And it would be interesting also as one of our uh, things to sort of tackle and try to synthesize his approaches to uh, to the question. But as soon as we take something as non-negotiable, as soon as we've ground, uh, as soon as we lock something in place in our heads, as Ken said, it changes our approach to everything. It, it, it also might make us much harder to negotiate with or argue with or whatever else. And some of those points are absolutely worth sticking on. Like, should there be slavery? Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that shouldn't be up to the states. I don't think that there should be like 13 American states that have slavery and then the rest that don't because that should just be a state's issue. That seems completely ridiculous to me. And and I'm I'm setting aside the question of wage slavery and uh, people who can't get out from under the situations that they're in, which seems sometimes very much like slavery. Uh, Kevin. I just want to note that there are three out of 12 people here who are female, and that's a rarely high percentage. And I want to acknowledge that and make sure that they are represented in voices when the, uh, uh, the guys talk so much. So. I, thank, I thank you for that, Kevin. I rue our imbalances and am grateful uh, that we're a little bit tippy toward maybe rebalancing someday here. Um, and I'm going to be looking for who would like to talk and so forth. Uh, let's let's try to use the raised, the Google, sorry, the Zoom raised hand here for stepping into the conversation, which will make it easy for me that way that I don't miss people. Um, but let's go that way. Mike. Uh, just real quickly, uh, in regard to our gender imbalance, I'm also working on the age imbalance and my daughter, Lizzie, who's 26, um, has promised to try to join. She's very interested in today's topic because she's doing a master's in environment and health, but she's tied up for at least the next half hour, but she'll, she might drop in unexpectedly and make sure you ask her about this amazing German uh, website with little videos that provide primers on everything from how the immune system works to what is ozone depletion to, I mean, they, they, these are exceptionally well-produced four, five minute videos. And she, she turned this, me off. Them. Is this Kurzgesagt? It's Kurzgesagt. It is so cool. And she will be not surprised to know that you already know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes, you know. Uh, Kurz Kazak is lovely, and I also love. Uh, there, there's many. I think. I think um, resources around this would be really good to share around as well. And we, we have. Uh, there are many people who are really good science explainers and other kinds of folks who are who are doing this work. So, um, the we're sort of it's it's interesting. We're kind of defaulting toward books. We have a collection of books because booky books are what Western culture does. Uh, to say this is what I mean and this is important, where these days uh, it seems so much of our culture is moving in people who have good explainers. And that turns out to be mostly, I think, explainer videos, whether on TikTok, uh, YouTube, or uh, Insta Reels or whatever. But 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 the way opinions are being shaped is shifting tremendously. And some some online celebrities have larger followerships than major news media have readers uh, or viewers, and then best-selling authors have readers, which is really, really interesting to me. Stacy, And I, I just, yeah, I just to add to that one more point. Uh, yeah. Lizzie also turned me on to an incredible article on how the, the, the world is being run by grown-up theater kids, which has oh. to which is reinforcing your point about how the way we present is really important. I'll put a link to the article. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I just wanted to connect what Mike was saying about primer videos to what you were saying, and also point out a slight difference between primer and explainer, because I think to have the primer 
and to encourage the open questioning of things. Because when too much information is given, it stifles or directs the way the questions are asked. And so let me just briefly state, I can speak freely now, but I'm down visiting a friend of many years who lost her husband, who's a MAGA person. And I'm under added stress right now because she has a very, very MAGA religious friend staying with us. And with yesterday's events of Tucker on Twitter, it's just been difficult, but I've been trying to have conversations without going into, I don't wanna derail the conversation. Let me just say that where I've been able to connect with her and her husband and have good conversations have been around food and pharmaceuticals. But part of what need, needed to happen was really bringing things down to the very, very, very basic level. And even when she brought, so she was watching Tucker yesterday with her earbuds and my other friend said, well, what'd you learn? And she said, I didn't know we sold the Panama Canal for $1. And I noticed in myself, I just didn't even, I wasn't even able to take the time and think of the right way to redirect that conversation. I just was so triggered, didn't even know how, you know, an immediate, my point is when you're watching a primer where you're not expected to really have any answers yet, and it's really encouraged that you ask the next basic question, just in opening up different possibilities, new questions arise. And I think that's what's really, really important. There's not enough space between basic and expert. So that, yeah, that's my point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stacy. I think that's a really important point you're making. And um, Wendy Elford, who is doesn't come to the Thursday calls very much, but she's on the Monday calls a lot and she's lovely, um, uses a thing called clean language, which is a kind of, I'm gonna paraphrase it badly, it's sort of an interviewing technique or a questioning technique that tries to not bias the questions yeah. by heading by heading in toward what the person you're asking about says. It, but, and she used it with me with an interview recently. Um, and I felt it felt like a dog chasing its tail a little bit because it was very sort of, it also felt like using uh, the Eliza program way back when. It's like, oh, okay, so, you're, so your mom used to lock you in the closet. How do you feel about your mom locking you in the closet? Was a little, a little bit about the cycle, but it was a, a, an interesting technique for doing what you're um, asking about, Stacey, which is trying not to inject the interviewer's bias or blocks or whatever into the interview. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Levine. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Michelski. Bro Brother Levine. <laughs> uh, I wanted to tell a brief anecdote, and it's, you know, books versus the way current information is coming out. So a, a, a classic example, I think, would be the debate last night, and the Indian candidate was kind of pontificating through most of his presentation. Um, Contrast that, I remember writing my first book, and one day I got extremely excited because in the process of writing with a really good uh, editorial team behind me, I got extremely excited about how much I was learning, and I didn't really care. I remember saying to myself, I don't care if this book ever gets published. I'm learning so much from this process of really digging in and having to clarify words and ground assessments and doing additional research. Uh, and that is one of the things that's missing in the universe that we are um, in today, because it's all moving so fast, sometimes too fast. And the missing piece around that is the dialogue uh, where we learn, where we explore ideas, where we connect with people, um, who've got different viewpoints. Um, so just my my two cents, I guess I'm I'm thank you, thank you, Judith. And I guess I'm I'm supporting Ken in terms of grounded assessments or, you know, um, which is a world that I know something about. Uh, <laughs> in part also the it it, it the world of evidence. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. You're welcome. Uh 
We've got Gil, you made it into the room. I'm pleased. Um, and I've not seen Pete. I've pinged Pete elsewhere and don't know uh, if he's going to make it to join us. Um, we shall see. Uh, and it's maybe the moment to start in on the conversation. Uh, the way I was thinking of doing it was uh, asking uh, anyone to choose one of the works on the list and represent it to us. Just brief us on it a little bit and say, given this book, uh, here is a framing that might be useful, and here's kind of how I responded to it or think about it or how it affected my thinking. Something of that order might work. Uh, so happy to start forever. Stuart. Thank you. I, you know, I'll, I'll start with Meg Wheatley's latest book, Who We Choose to Be, which I was pleased to see on the list. Second edition um, is much richer and deeper than the first edition. And just by way of um, brief background, I've known Meg for um, over 25 years. We share a publisher. Um, and in her background um, is both um, uh, systems theory and organizational consulting. And, and those two things I think are important. The systems theory piece perhaps even more than the organizational consulting, but they're, they're, they're um, hand in glove. And she traveled around the world for 35 years as a, as a um, you know, person of the 60s, thinking that we can change this, we can fix this, we can create a world where liberal democracy flourishes, where humanity, human values are present. And after doing that for 35 or 40 years, working in government, working um, in for-profit, working in nonprofit, working in spiritual communities, she just concluded that there are too many vectors <laughs> pointing in the wrong direction and that the system can't support itself and you know grounded her assessments in 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 what she saw in the world and in the previous um writings about um collapse many of which are cited in the in the in the literature list that we that we looked at and so um essentially um she has um adopted um, the, the philosophy at a, at a core level of, of Chogan Trumpka, and Pema Chogan was her mentor for many years. Um, and it's the notion of the spiritual warrior. And essentially what this book promotes is um, collapse will happen. Um, who do you choose to be? The title of the book, what identity do you want to assume as we're moving towards collapse of some kind? We don't know what that looks like exactly. Although on occasion, Meg will turn into Nostradamus and make a, a prediction that she doesn't broadcast, but, but she'll make it to, to, to close folks. Um, and so that's essentially what the book is about. Um, and in, in my interpretation, it's kind of like, okay, you know, there, there are forms of collapse that are coming. I mean, an example, it's interesting, Jerry, when you, when you talked about the, um, the debate about climate change, um, and, and I think about, for example, the, you know, the U.S. Congress, things are just so dysfunctional that there can't even be a real dialogue about it. And whatever any one side does, the other side uses as a as a as a as a hammering block um, in terms of its its it, it, its own politics. Um, but there's there's no dialogue. It, it's funny. I was just thinking this morning about connecting with a friend of mine who's intimate a colleague, intimately involved with um, with the Washington community, and and saying, you know, Ira. <laughs> is there any hope? I, I said to him so many times, you know, I'd love to engage. And he said, no, there's, there's, there's no hope. There's, 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 there's no hope at all. So um, essentially Meg's book is, is about 
and 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 it's um it's got a lot of detail it's got a lot of grounding um about who do you choose to be going forward um do you want to be um someone who if things collapse and get real bad turn into the beast nature of human beings or do you want to carry that human spirit and be a spiritual warrior and essentially the message is that um at times of crisis, historically, the spiritual warriors um, arise. Um, there is a um, a Hebrew um, piece of mythology about a group called the Lamed Vavniks. The Lamed Vavniks. Um, it was beautifully articulated in a book that was originally um, published in French. Um, that there are um, thirty six human beings, which is a function of 18, which is a function of high, which stands for living in the in Hebrew um, um, lexicon, um, that hold up the world uh, in terms of spiritual foundation. And if, if they collapse, the world kind of falls apart. So it's similar to that. The spiritual warriors arise and carry, carry humanity and the human dignity of being a human being. Um, forward. Um, so there will be something after collapse, um, whatever that might look like, what collapse will look like, we don't know. But in the meantime, we continue to do our good work, whatever that happens to be. And, and this perspective certainly has sustained me over the last seven or eight years of, of, of working intimately with the warrior community. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. Stuart, Stuart, thank you. Uh, two things. One, thank you for sharing at the end how you have dealt with this. I think us sharing our stories of how we cope and how we manage and how we frame our heads is really important. And second, before turning to Kevin, I'd like to know if anyone else wants to say things about that book, who do you want to be? Uh, so that we can stay on the book for just a moment longer and see what uh, what we know about it collectively. Uh, Judy. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, more, one more thing, Jerry. I actually just finished. Um, I'm working on a project called the uh, Thoughtful Citizen Handbook, which is a, a global piece. And, and Meg um, is contributing to that. What's it take to be a thoughtful citizen going forward? And um, so she sent me she sent me the, the her manuscript, which was filled with art. And I just cut out all the art, took the um, the introduction <laughs> and the conclusion and turned it into uh, a piece that she's now going to edit down from 4,000 words to 3,000 words. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Judy, uh, over to you. I just wanted to add, and, and I haven't read the book, but something I've been doing for probably 30 years is kind of fundamentally asking myself almost daily, who do I want to be? What do I want to do? What's important to do? And I find it a really positive reflection <laughs> in terms of centering for each day and whatever it is that's surfacing in that temporal period in terms of, you know, what can I influence? How could I influence? How could I encourage discussion? Those kinds of things. Just wanted to share it as a practice. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Jones. Yeah, a book that I posted there is How Wealth Rules the World. And it's not your typical anti-capitalist polemic. Um, there are a lot of those. <clears throat> this is by the uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, a guy that I've gotten to know named Ben Price. And it's how corporate personhood arose, <clears throat> you know, through this Dillon rule that let a, a railroad override uh, the, the ordinances in a municipality <clears throat> and how that became a, a premise. And there's privileged property and pr uh, personal property and wealth and corporations got to, to rule those things. But he's also deconstructing that in you know, probably 60 or 70 cities and townships around the country. And they're asserting township rights to stop fracking or this, to stop the transport of toxic waste. 
And sometimes they, it works that they get enough action uh, around them and that something gets stopped. And Ecuador, which has adopted this more holy, holy than any other country, they just stopped mining uh, yesterday, I think it was. But it's, it's a, it's a, we're looking to see if we can be a part of that uh, in Western North Carolina around Black Mountain and our Swannanoa River. But it's a really, it's a movement kind of book. And, and he sees his work in line with Thurgood Marshall and uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And you just get lots of small decisions that change the debate all over the place or what's her name that <clears throat> finally got uh, marriage uh, done. Uh, somebody had actually have, had dinner with. And, you know, uh, Ginsburg said Roe v. Wade was really a, a strategic mistake. He gave them something to aim at. She did things like made it legal for women to have checkbooks and made it legal for women to have a mortgage and to own title and lots of little things that nobody took aim at. And they're doing a lot of those kinds of things. And, uh, some of them are holding up and some of them, you know, in one of the most active places, it's they've, they've uh, tried 10 times to, to get it passed. The state's pushed them down and now the town has made it impossible for them to, to do a petition like that again. <clears throat> and I was talking to him about um, essentially towns have dependent status to states and you can't stop somebody doing something in your city or town that is illegal in the state. And I was saying, this is a lot like the Marshall Trilogy that led uh, Native Americans to be dependent nation status. And uh, the way uh, reservations and towns have the same legal status as in relation to corporations. So I really, really recommend it. And he's doing webinars on each chapter of the book. Uh, the next one is in a couple of weeks about uh, cities and towns as colonies. That's pretty interesting i think thanks kevin i just uh looked it up the Ke the kindle version is on sale for two dollars and sixty cents ish or something like that so i hmm. recommend, recommend going there um if anybody's interested uh anyone else uh know of the book and want to comment on it uh gil You have to find the unmute button first. There you go. On um, different technologies. Yeah. Uh, what was Kevin? What was the name of that book again? It, it's on the spreadsheet that is linked, but it's okay. how wealth rules the world by Ben Price. Yeah, yeah. From the Community thank you. Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Yeah. Thank you. I think the notion of lots of little things they can't take aim on is really fascinating and powerful. And I say that as somebody who tends to be drawn to the big things. And part of the response that uh, you know that Stuart and Meg are articulating is to you know, kind of calm down slow down, take a deep breath, look at what's available here within my reach. What can I do that moves things? I just want to, I just want to say an endorsement of Meg's book. I'm in the middle of reading it now. I'm in the first edition, so I don't know what the differences with the second are, um, uh, but it's deep and wise. And, um, and, and um, how to say this, You know, this as I as I interpret the spiritual warrior discipline, it's to it's to go into the heart of the battle, um, uh, without regard to whether it's a win or lose battle. It's the thing to do now, and uh, it's. Um, um, I've been reading some of the ancient Greek tragedies, and people are talking about uh, about a tragic view of the world. I mean, I've. I'm 74. I came of age in the 50s and 60s and 70s on a trajectory of progressive progress in human history. And I sort of lived in the story that that was the trajectory of the future, uh, when in fact, human history is a lot more ups and downs and bumps and gains. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm I'm sort of Struggling is not the right word. I'm sort, of, I'm sort of dancing with the possibility of accepting that as, as a reality of the human experience, that it rises and falls. And we've had some fortunate times and there will be setbacks as we're seeing, and there will be progress in the future. And, um, you know, kind of taking the long view, uh, um, the catastrophes that we are facing are, 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 are local in time. Um, you know, they're not geological in time. Uh, the, you know, life on the planet doesn't die from climate change. 
human civilization sh shifts dramatically, maybe. Um, so anyhow, it's a little rambly, um, but uh, the book is 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 deeply valuable. I encourage people to read it. And I'm going to also post something, uh, not now, I'm on the phone and headed to a doctor's appointment, uh, but about a very interesting view of, of how we are captured, uh, both left and right, how we are captured by our narratives um, and how and how that capture blinds us uh, to looking with really discerning eye at what we're facing. So thank you, guys. I look forward to that post. Um, I wanted to add. There, I wanted to add. Uh, I put regulatory capture in the chat, which is just one of really many big issues we're popping open here. Because the book Kevin recommended, uh, a corporate personhood, is one of the many different ways that capitalism has managed to rest, sort of put put society into a into a uh, hammerlock. And we, it's a hammerlock that a lot of places can't get out of. I remember when, when the baby bells sort of, when at t was broken up and split into the baby bells, the hope was that that act would actually lead toward better competition and commun communications, blah, 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 uh, across the country. What happened was the baby bells shrank back into one or two players. Uh, they got reconstituted mm -hmm. as a duopoly. And that's kind mm -hmm. of the world that we're still living in. And... Mm -hmm. They have a lot of lawyers, and I I thought that municipal broadband would be a simple, easy, cheap thing that every town in, and city in the country would go implement because uh, maintaining just TCP IP connectivity over wireless ain't that hard or expensive uh, if you're if that's what you're trying to do, not any other fancy business. And uh, they managed to pass laws that made it almost impossible. In many municipalities, they had a two-year window to try to do muni broadband. And if they failed, then there was no recourse. They, they gave up the right to do so forever. And then there was interference for those two years so that nothing happened, et cetera, et cetera. And, and a bunch of people like Sasha Meinrath and a few others mm -hmm. basically tried to fight those battles. Uh, Brett uh, Fleischman, I think, and, and a couple uh, Frischman and a couple others yeah. uh, went there as well. And, and we see this everywhere and we don't notice it or pay attention to it or seem to say that much about it. And there's a lot of literature about it as well. Go ahead, Gil. Yeah, it turns out that capitalists don't believe in capitalism. Hmm. Which is really strange. I mean, uh, capitalism, yeah. when it works properly, gives you monopoly rents, which are the best kind of rents. If you go read the read the old literature on economics, like you want monopoly rents. And to do that, you have to do illegitimate things. Uh, well, in cap and cap. And cap and, and the way that capitalism works for a long time now is to privatize profits and socialize risks and, and skew the market. Just on right. the broadband thing, John Farrell at Institute for Local Self-Reliance has been fierce on this for decades. ILSR.org has done a lot of pioneering work on local control. David Morris, who was co-founder with me and, and, and Neil Seldman back 100 years ago, did a book on neighborhood power uh, with Carl Hess. Um, it was an interesting story in himself. Carl was a, a, a conservative, was Barry Goldwater's speechwriter and fled from that world and became more of a libertarian socialist later in his life. The Neighborhood Power book is another one seminal about this kind of work that Kevin's talking about. If I can wow. add one thing, on, <clears throat> I used to have the, actually I had the, the first web-based legislative monitoring system, which was in Mississippi oh, because- That was you. It, yeah, yeah. Well, but it, it was uh, because uh, Mississippi was five years behind Arkansas in technology adoption, and I didn't buy the hundred thousand dollar deck elephants. But I had a complete system, right? So I had oh. regulatory uh, appointments, legislative monitoring, court opinions, and I talked to the lobbyists. It doesn't really matter. We'll beat them in regulations, and because we send you know five. Um, MBAs with, with sharp teeth into all the regulatory hearings that they can't go to. And we continue to have them. I said, well, how can I keep up with regulations? Just, there is no way. They don't publish that calendar and you can't make it that transparent. I can make the I can make court opinions transparent and make appointments transparent. I can make legislation transparent. But regulations, you had to go and look on the, uh, the bulletin board and they, they, they kept it from being digitized. So they beat um, them at regulations. Also, before going to Stuart and Mike, I wanted to add in uh, a link I put in the chat uh, to a thought in my brain about historic cycles. Uh, there are many, many, many different theories about cycles and types of cycles. There are also uh, in innovation cycles. Uh, Carlotta <laughs> Perez talks about technological sur uh, surges uh, in her book, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. 
uh, there are there's the fourth turning, uh, which is the Strauss and Howe uh, generational theory. And uh, Steve Bannon is a big fan of the fourth turning theory because he thinks that we're in a cycle now where if he can accelerate the destruction of most of the economies and, and political systems, then he gets to design their successor states, which is what he which, what, what I think his big project is afoot. So I think that uh, some of these notions of historic cycles are, are really important uh, in the conversation about change and how to cause or stop change. With that, I will go to Stuart and then Mike. And since we're going really quickly, feel free to um, take your time stepping into the conversation. Uh, I will defer to Mike who needs to get out of here quickly. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. I, I had a real quick uh, ins point to insert. I, I'm gonna be in a car and gonna be hard to uh, comment. Uh, I, I was interested that uh, the book 1771 BC, the year civilization collapsed was on the list. I have not read the book, but I have watched about an hour of uh, a YouTube lecture by the author, and it's absolutely fascinating. And for me, it answered a question, which is, you know, how does climate change completely disrupt society? I mean, um, the usual model, I think, is, okay, people at the bottom end start starving, that leads to conflict within the society. But the story from 1771 BC. 1177. Oh, 1177, right. I'm sorry. Um, the story there was that uh, it, uh, climate change triggered mass migration. And the, the literature in these different areas around the Mediterranean was full of these stories of the, the invaders, the outsiders. You know, all these people showed up who were from some other part of the Mediterranean. Nobody knew where they came from, but they they were in their civilization was in crisis. They had no food. So they and, and this just rippled. and and uh, uh, it's a little bit of an exaggeration to say that civilization collapsed, but there was just mass disruption that that really set back progress for for not just decades, but probably centuries. You had a lot of civilizations that, had well-established government structures and infrastructure and boom. So uh, I, I, I don't know if I can recommend the book, but uh, an hour of the video would be well, well worth your time. Um, although the thing that comes back from watching that is things are damn, damn fragile. I and thought you were going to use that word. Back then, they didn't know how to fine tune everything, right? They didn't have MBAs who could trim till there was no fat. So they always had excess capacity. But even with the excess capacity, when subject to climate crisis and mass migration of people with, with weapons, um, things did not last. So anyway, thank you, Stuart, for letting me chime in. I will try to join you from the car. Um, and I, I hope we continue this discussion and I hope we continue collecting these books. Although every time I see these lists, I start thinking I need to live forever just to keep up. Immortality is a thing. It's just not a real thing. Yeah. Um, and and oh. I'll, I'll see you. Uh, see you. Uh, see you on my phone. Thanks, Mike. Has anyone else uh, read the book uh, 1177 BC or watched the video that would like to comment? Yeah, I read the book. <clears throat> I found it really interesting. I mean, it's uh, there was much, many more matriarchies before these invaders came, and they they just didn't know how to respond, and they they had not seen the kind of ruthlessness that these folks had, and they were used to sort of a lot of incremental warfare that would move things a little bit, and and these were like, you know, uh, Shaka Zulu kinds of folks, you know. Uh, burn the village, salt the fields, take the women and children. And it's like, they never, they, they just, they didn't know what to do. So it was a um, one, of the, one of the big problems in history seems to be that pacifist uh, groups don't survive assaults from violent groups. <laughs> and violent groups win and then destroy everything. And uh, it's very hard to, it's very hard to turn yourself into a puffer fish or a porcupine <laughs> or, or a, a poisonous toad or whatever, so that, you know, when somebody tries to eat you, they have to spit you out. 
Uh, that we haven't figured out how to do that as civilizations. Yeah, I, I, they were I put, I put, I, They I were just one used to that kind of warfare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, on that note, I put in the chat a book called "The Parable of the Tribes" by Andrew Schmuckler. It's about twenty or thirty years old, but it, but it goes into exactly that question of how how do you prevent the most aggressive from dominating? And it's not it's not an encouraging read. Thank you. I didn't realize that was, uh, I've got it in my brain, but I didn't realize it was so on topic that way. Really appreciate Very much. It. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, anyone else want to talk about 1177? Or yeah, I, just, I just want to comment to the little dialogue going on. In negotiating theory, um, the, uh, <laughs> the mantra is, if you're, if you are um, a puffer fish, you know, negotiating with someone who's uh, uh, aggressive, you better figure that out quickly and change your tactic because otherwise you'll get eaten alive. Um, it's just the way the, the way the world seems to be working. Um, there are also like little critters that eat the stingers of larger critters and then become poisonous themselves. Hmm. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of interesting strategies in nature to be undesirable or scary or something. There's there's just sort of camouflage defense mechanisms like having a big eye, what looks like a big eye on your fin so that you look like a bigger fish than you really are. But but there are other other sort of ways that you become really undesirable. And I, I, I just, I've, I've puzzled on that a little bit. Um, Cory Doctorow's book, Walk Away, has an interesting thesis that hey, when somebody nastier than you shows up, you just walk away and leave them your settlement, which they will then destroy. But that sci-fi future presupposes that you have 3D printing and the ability to extract water and energy from just about anywhere you go. Uh, and so you can rebuild your village with, and in fact, it'll be better because you saved the plans in the cloud and you've been improving the plans as you thought about them and as you use the space. So you can go instantiate something even cooler. Uh, it's a it's a nice thought, but we don't have the technologies to support the actual activity of the rebuilds in that sense. Um, Stuart, did you want to add something else into the conversation or a different book? Yeah, I, uh, it's not a, it's not a different book. I wanted to make a few comments. Um, so, uh, in terms of um, <clears throat> the book that Kevin was talking about um, about capitalism, um, I pondered a lot. You know. Uh, what what drives politics? Is it economics, or does economics drive politics, or does politics drive economics? And um, I think it's 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 that um, economics is driving politics, um, and and that's the that's that's the universe um, that we're in today, um, um, and that's why we're in 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 in, in great trouble. Um, you can have all these wonderful theories. But um, the economics is what's behind it. At least that's my personal experience um, working in the legal system and getting um, disillusioned. Um, I could tell many, many stories, um, like you know, Kevin told stories about the lack of access to the legislative process. Um, I can talk about. Um, um, strange happenings down in the litigation um, process. Um, so I just wanted to throw that throw that in. And the tragedy uh, of today's world, I think, in the negotiating realm, um, because yes, everything is um, cyclical. Jerry, you should add the cycle of resolution <laughs> to, your, to, your, to your brain. We can do that kind of offline. Um, because I realized in the in the little microcosm of divorce mediation that I was working in, and taking that and interpolated that to the larger world, um, the fighting never really gets anything resolved because it just perpetuates uh, another battle, the next battle, um, because of the psychological and emotional um, aspects of of quote getting even. Um, that being so, said, Stuart, yeah. When have you seen that cycle broken? Say in your divorce mediation work. Oh, when people come to resolution, when they actually get down into some heartfelt dialogue about you know what's going on and what has happened, and the tragedy, I think, 
in the in the larger world, and I'm looking at the U.S. Congress, is that people are not engaged in any kind of dialogue. There's nobody facilitating a much deeper and richer dialogue, because um, in the meantime, the interests, the real interests of people, um, are not being addressed and taken care of, and we've devolved into tribal warfare. <laughs> um, there, there, there it is. Or when I say either devolved or um, we have not been able to get beyond tribal warfare into a different mindset, the transformation of the, of the human um, being and how they're able to act. Um, I mean, and that's part of the, the philosophy that Meg Wheatley is actually articulating, which I came to a, a, a long time ago. Our Gil, brief comment? Brief comment. Um... Jane's theory, I'm not sure her historical basis of this, was that Gingrich in the 1990s broke the social relationships between congressional families by changing the schedule, meeting schedule of the House so that folks couldn't hang out with each other on weekends with their kids and their wives and actually have a social matrix within which to have a different kind of conversation. And how intentional that was, I don't know, but that seems to be one of the pivot points in the, in the collapse of uh, dialogue in the U.S. government. Yeah, and people people needed to go back to their districts and fundraise um, yeah. on on weekends, um, and they left their families back in their in their districts. So, so I yeah. have a little bit of evidence collected on this thesis of Jane's. Uh, these are all articles that point to mm. so how Gingrich basically in in, in the ninth, he came into office in 1994 as Speaker of the House. Uh, that was the Gingrich Revolution, which luckily did not last very long, but he changed everything. And he made it so that if you were seen talking to the enemy, to Democrats, you would not get funding for your primary. And being primaried is everybody's worst fear. Like, like politicians, Republican uh, congressmen, don't Congress critters, don't fear general elections, they fear primaries. Um, and they need lots of money for primaries because money is speech. Uh, thank you, Citizens United. There's all these things that are sort of built up here. Um, I will and, and and Gingrich is echoing Kevin Jones here, or or, or vice versa, because there's a bunch of very small moves below the radar. Can't see them, can't fight them, but cumulatively, they produce an enormous shift in the culture. Exactly. In friend, Congress. Yeah. yeah, my friend Ira Chalif, who I alluded to before is on the ground in DC for many, many years. And he just validated that from his experience and observation, that is exactly what, what went on. I want to switch to Michael and ask you to step in whenever you'd like. And then I'm going to point out that Kalia is very nicely putting positive things in the chat, like, hey, we should use beavers as models for how to construct things. I want to draw you into the conversation, Kalia, uh, and also urge all of us to point to some of the some of the books and, and media that are about restoration, revivification, revitalization, whatever all the positives are here. Uh, but first, Michael, then Stacy. Um, before I say what I was going to say, I, uh, I want to appreciate that, that Kalia is, is like thinking very big and, uh, and I loved though, um, I'm sure it probably pushed some people's buttons for like, you know, how can we rechannel, uh, MBS's, um, insatiable desire for world acceptance and money. Um, I mean, his, his money and his, his, he doesn't have an insatiable desire for money because he's got plenty of money, but um, yeah. What I was gonna mention was actually something that um, resonated for me out of, um, I, think, I think Jerry, you might've been um, talking about broadband, public broadband and, and the, you know, what seems like it should have been the inevitable move to broadband as, as a public good. Um, and I'm really wondering, I've been wondering this for a while around just digital selfhood in general and the degree to which it's been um, appropriated, muzzled, suffocated in, in various ways that, you know, people are not able to own their digital selves, that um, 
to deny access, to deny digital access to every citizen at this point is tantamount to denying them both the right to speech and the right to receive the speech of others. And that there seems like there's potentially a very originalist friendly nonpartisan argument um, to that effect. And, uh, you know, I don't know what lawyers <laughs> who are interested in this kind of thing we all know, but, you know, building that case um, seems like a crucial thing right now. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's funny that the radio spectrum, which is mentioned, I think, which is much less important to this at this point, is a publicly owned thing, not that the government hasn't sold off, you know, swaths of it, um, but the ability to digitally connect is, is almost completely privatized. Um, and that is just so crucial to all of us at this point. Um, so yeah, anybody who's um, interested in pursuing that, love to talk to. Thanks, Michael. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear other thoughts on that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyone else on that uh, on that thread? It'll circle back, I'm sure. Um, Stacy, please. Yeah, I just really wanted to quickly confirm that you know I told you about the MAGA couple that I spend time with, and I wanted to say that two nights earlier, we really had a good conversation, and we actually agreed on many things. It took work on my part, but it made a big difference. And this morning, she couldn't wait to have breakfast with me. So it does make a difference. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Thank you. And the conversations you're having like that are super, super important. Yeah, but um, I don't want to do them anymore. <laughs> really? Uh, they're a little exhausting. I need huh? a, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. The one, the, I thought we were safe until I realized. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I thought I was talking to somebody who was like a MAGA who was now looking for a new candidate. So I said something, and I think I had called Donald a grifter. And her face changed. And I said, are you being sarcastic? And she goes, no. And when I found out that she really believes everything he said, then like I told my other friend, there's no, that is the, found, I, if I can't convince her that he's a liar, that's at the foundation of everything else because all the media is all polluted based on that. There's nowhere to go. I, I, I can't, so it's too stressful. <laughs> Oh, well, that that setting in her head was created by humans influencing her in lots of interesting ways. It, it, it wasn't natural. And if you scroll back some period of time, she didn't have that in her head. She didn't have that belief. So it, it got put there or made there or created there. And I don't mean that she wasn't actively involved in the creation of it, that it was an implant, but rather that there was this interesting mechanism whereby she now believes that thing there's got to be, and, and I, I share your frustration, Stacey, but there's got to be some way of like popping the bubble, releasing the dam, uh, breaking the flood, cracking that reality or that image. So for my friend, yes, because we've already gotten there where yeah. she's actually very insightful. She actually was honest enough to say, if I, ch if I change my thinking, my whole worldview explodes and I'm not ready for that. And that was very insightful. And then we had some other very deep talks where she said, I do know you're right, but she's tuned out. Like she keeps saying, I'm not, I don't have opinions and I keep saying you do. But for this other woman, it's too big. It's too, like, even when I said, Google it. Oh no, I don't Google anything. I was like, well, just Google to, you know, because I had said things. She was like, I never heard any of those. I said, well, look it up. But, we, but again, it was a nice conversation it's too far gone. It's it's just too much. It's in, and she's also a very Christian person. So her information is, it's too big. It's the best I could say, it's all deep state. Everything is deep state. There's no place to go. Um, 
I'll just add one last thing here and then I'll see if Kalia would like to step yeah, in. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, don't be sorry, Stacey. It's you're, hard. You're, I need you're, a break. <laughs> you're actually doing the work that is the reason we're holding this conversation. Right. Thank you. So so we're sitting here talking about books and issues, but if nobody's willing to open a book or look at or listen to an issue, then we ain't going to get any place anyway. And the, the thing I wanted to add to what you're saying is that it feels to me like so much of the battle right now is over identity. And I'm trying to puzzle through more what I mean by that and what, what the implications are. But when somebody has to give up a belief system that is now integral to their identity, because all their friends believe it, because they've stood on it for so long and made enemies along the way and lost, they've sacrificed a lot of things because of this belief system. It, those things are very difficult to change. They're, once it Once it's welded to who you think you are, that's really hard and you need some break with who you think you are to get there. And maybe it's psilocybin. I don't know. Uh, ketamine. Have you slipped some ketamine in her coffee and her morning coffee? I'm just saying, maybe that's not a good thing. Uh, Stuart, quick thought. Yeah, quick thought, Jerry. I just want to validate what you said about um, this notion of identity in areas like this. A friend of mine has written a most beautiful article about it, Elizabeth Bader, um, and, and, and it's the, um, I think she calls it the IDR cycle. Um, and it's how we get psychologically attached to that identity and giving up that identity is almost like a little bit of a death. Um, that's what it, that's what it feels like. Um, the, the other thought I had, Stacy, as you were speaking, it takes infinite patience, infinite patience. And okay. If you come at it with, with a scintilla of adversarialness in your being as opposed to love, you're not going anyplace. That's got to be the overriding emotion. Um, uh, you can't say you're wrong. Um, and the other, the last thought is people latch on to um, uh, uh, an autocrat like Trump or, or others when they're living in a place of resignation and they just want to hang their hat onto something as opposed to um, thinking through things themselves. And they swallow it whole hog that somebody's gonna save them. Well, if I could just, I, I wanna add a point because I think this is important because even my one friend said about this other friend, another group that I think is being left out. So this, again, this is acknowledged by my friend that this woman, once Trump came into the picture is not really the brightest woman, but all of a sudden she feels very smart. She feels like she knows things that other people don't know. And that is making her feel very powerful. Now she believes she's doing God's work. So that also ties back into, you know, she feels like she's a spiritual warrior. So that there's a whole nother conversation to be had around that. That's a great conversation. Really important. Um, Kalia, you've been trying patiently to step into the conversation, I think, for a little bit. I would love to <clears throat> invite you in. I wasn't trying to say anything, but I've been chatting in the chat. Yes. Oh, I, saw, I, I, saw you, I saw you unmute a couple of times. <clears throat> like, oh, oh, oh. I think, um, like, for me, I was... I was feeling very upset about the state of the world. Um, and I went to a watershed restoration workshop uh, in the Sierra foothills put on by my friends. Um, and they were working on, they spent 18 months on the land before they did anything really like living there walking they had 80 acres and then they brought in bulldozers <laughs> and sort of block because there was a stream a stream running through it but it had um sort of ended up with a really deep gully instead of the water spreading out so they like really thoughtfully addressed um mm -hmm. sorry that just a sec uh, really thoughtfully like change the flow of that stream to have the water spread out more during when the water anyways apparently it's been a great success I haven't been back there since they did it but the other thing was really stewarding the forests so 
half of the challenge with wildfires in California is global warming. A significant portion is just our complete failure to steward the forests. And I really saw that. They showed us like a part, you know, a set of, you know, I don't know how big, <clears throat> like, you know, 50 meters by like 50 meters chunk that they'd really gone and like cut down all the the pine trees they'd mulched them and put them on to like they hadn't removed them completely they just were like indigenous people didn't let pine trees grow they're like weeds of the forest they suck up a lot of water they're super flammable they have really great ladders up to the canopy and so before we showed up 150 years ago there was active land management for 10,000 years and we've left the forests alone and we're like, oh my God, they're burning up. And I, I actually think we could really address forest fires in California if we did some sort of like work, you know, WPA thing and got millions of children, you know, young people between the ages of 18 and 25 out into the forest and dealt with them properly. And then continued to do that with people living on the land. The fact that we've pushed, you know, people are in cities and we're not taking care of the land is a significant problem. And I also think, you know, this kind of like sort of belief that industrial civilization solutions to drawdown are enough is ridiculous. We should also be thinking really big about grassland restoration and places of the world with abundant grasslands that have been deprecated because the last ice age was caused by grassland growth right so i want to live on a planet that's cooler by the end of my lifetime and the current dominant public narratives don't have a cooler planet for 250 years and i just don't think it's good enough so anyways, that's my, <laughs> my two cents. And I, I may have to go to talk to the person who just called me. So Kalia, thank you really very much. Um, I want, there's, there's a, a bunch of literature about what you just said. One of my favorite books is called the biggest estate on earth by Bill Gamage. <clears throat> and part of what he says is, Hey, if, uh, he, he says, Aboriginal tribes, which have been on the land in Australia, possibly as long as 50,000 years, certainly 30,000 years, um, managed the landscape. And they, as, as they walked around, they did stuff that made it easier to eat and live. Even though we think of Australia as like maybe one of the least hospitable continents, they actually made it really work. And then the, the first fleet shows up. And if you read the diaries of the first Europeans landing on the shores there, they write in their diaries, gosh, you, you ride your horse through the woods and it's it's like a gentleman's garden in England. There's an apple up here. There's a gourd down there. And they think this is a natural occurrence. They think the locals are lazy because when they see somebody fishing, what the, what the person is doing is they're putting a couple stones at the bottom of the weir, which is just a bunch of big stones that form a trap in the, in the river. They, they block the bottom of the, and they leave, you leave the weir open all year long. You only block the bottom just when the fish are going to run. Then you put stones in the bottom. You wait for this weir to fill up with fish. And then you get, step in there and you like reach the fish out to your buddy on the shore. And then you smoke them, salt them, do whatever you're going to do. And you have protein for a long time, et cetera, et cetera. And um, they, they, they completely misunderstood what happened. And then worse they brought sheep, which are not native to Australia, and they let sheep loose on the landscape. And the sheep went The sheep went out and basically ate everything that the Aboriginal groups had planned and done. Um, and I'm exaggerating, I think maybe only a little, but it's crazy how much we knew and how much we've destroyed it. So Braiding Sweetgrass, there's a bunch of other books, Tyson Yoga Porta, uh, Sand Talk are the ones we've been pointing to in these conversations. But these are what I find really interesting is that the, this little collection of books that I'm talking about now are, are stories of collapse and renewal baked into one, except backwards. They're stories of how renewal worked and what we knew about how to renew ourselves, and then how we broke that and, 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 and killed our, you know, practically killed ourselves while civilizing the people in the landscape. And that's the story of human history, largely, unfortunately. So um, I'm interested in how we 
derive from all these things, positive stories and uplift and renewal. And Kalia, I love your wish that in our lifetimes that these trends turned around. Uh, the momentum of something as big as a planet uh, will carry us through current trends really pretty far is the unfortunate thing. Uh, but I don't know how unfortunate that needs to be. And uh, uh, there's a thought in my brain that this year is a particular, th there's been a thought about uh, <clears throat> climate change will bring extreme weather uh, along, along. So I, I added a thought this year that 2023 seems like an extreme, extreme weather year. It's not quite named that. But the, the, the kinds of incidents we're seeing now and are likely to see more of might convince a few people, might not. One of the good things about the weather events is that they seem to be equal opportunity assailers. Uh, meaning you can't be rich enough to sort of escape, you know, uh, the, the, the outcomes of your city being coated in smoke because Canada has been ablaze since early spring, uh, remarkably, things like that. Sorry to go on and on here, but um, I'm catching up on the chat a little bit. Stuart added his cycle of resolution um, from, I think, one of the chapters of his book. Thank you for that, Stuart. And Ken, you haven't uh, jumped in, and I know that you a lot you hold a lot of these books and a lot of these ideas in your in your head and soul as well. And I'm wondering if you'd like to step in. Well, there's so much to choose from. <laughs> and Kalia, thank you. I, you just said you need to go. Oop, go ahead, Ken. Um, there's so much to choose from. I'm not quite sure where to start. I guess uh, I read the Wizard, the Wizard and the Prophet, a couple years ago, and uh, that was a remarkable book. I, I knew nothing of. Uh, either the two scientists in our Norman uh, Borlaug or um, Vote, what was Vote's first name? William Vote, I think. So, uh, William Vogt, yes. Yeah. The 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 prophet was William Vote was kind of the founder of the modern um, uh, environmental movement, and um, he's like, you know, Earth has a carrying capacity issue, and we are headed for breaking that very quickly. Um, and Borlaug uh, won a Nobel Prize. He's basically the guy behind the Green Revolution. There's, the jury is still definitely out on whether the Green Revolution was a good thing or not, because while it did allow us to um, feed millions of people and, and therefore we had a huge population explosion, it came at an exorbitant, exorbitant ecological cost. Um, and what prompted man to write this book was he um, had a daughter and he said, you know, by the time my daughter is an adult, there's going to be 10 billion people on the planet. How can we uh, feed and and support 10 billion people? And he did a really deep dive. And this book is, I don't know, it's like 600 pages. So there's all kinds of stuff in there. And he paints, um, he leaves it up to the reader to decide. There's no, you know, this is going to be this way or that way. He makes a really good case for um, collapse. And he makes a really good case for how we might invent our way out of some things. But probably uh, it's going to be pretty tough. And that's kind of where I come down uh, to talk earlier about, you know, Stuart mentioned how he gets through it. I have days where I get really depressed. You know, this summer was very hard with all the fires and the heat and stuff. And, um, and it's like, wow, we're, we're just, we're, we're, we're frying. And I don't know that we can turn the heat down. Um, and then I have, I have, you know, I come out of it. And it's like, okay, well, it doesn't matter whether we can or not. I still am here. I have to do whatever I can. And I get determined again to, you know, work with compassion and and have a view of no matter what, I'm going to do what I can. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a schizophrenic existence. You know, I, I really want to believe that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to get through the worst of it and avoid the, we're going to get through and avoid the worst of it. And I'm not convinced of that. So I have to balance in my head what I, uh, what I take in and, um, that's why I read a lot of poetry. <laughs> it's it's a great antidote uh, to all of the the heavy stuff. Um, so there's a few other books in there. I also read Sound Talk and Braiding Sweet Grass. Um, and on Stuart's recommendation, I, I picked up Restoring the Kinship Worldview, although I haven't started that yet. I think coming out of my world, um, ontological coaching, we talk about there's one planet and there are um, many, there's as many worlds as there are people. So we each have our own world. And, and some of them are very small worlds and some of them are very large, you know, the, the go to any country, you're in a different world. People have a completely different worldview and it's worldviews that create worlds. And I think that we've, we humans, us humans, because I know Gil's going to say who's us, who's we, 
us humans, uh, us modern humans, us weird humans, us global north humans, we have um, really gotten away from the recognition that we are of the earth. We come out of the earth and we think we're above it and we think we're separate from it. And we think we can do whatever we want to it. And now we're learning very, very rapidly that that's having enormous consequences. And will it be enough to restore the kinship over? Will it be enough to begin to act as if we are related to everything? I hope so. I don't know. How do you get 8 billion people to make this enormous shift? I think it's certainly possible. You know, uh, the advertising industry and the PR industry have, have mastered, and we were just talking about this earlier, how to make people believe certain things, especially people who are not curious, people who will just accept stuff. So what if all that, instead of turning it towards political ends, what if that was all turned towards um, how can humans survive and flourish in the future? You know, uh, we could certainly use all those, those technologies of persuasion to shift people's behavior at scale. But what it's going to take to make that happen is a question I don't have the answer to. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Doug. So I have a tiny thought or a quibble with myself. Uh, it fascinates me how we have a book called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Gibbon. Uh, that's an extraordinary history of the complexities, especially the interpersonal complexities of what a collapse looks like. And I know almost nobody who's read it, and I can't figure out why. End of thought. Thanks, Doug. Judy, you're muted. I shouldn't just interject, but it, 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 to, to most people, it probably sounds like ancient history, and they're not into ancient history. And they don't realize it's deeper than that. Um. Doug, I'm wondering what your um, pantheon of books on these topics is. If you had to name a half dozen uh, things to go look at around this, um, separate from Garden World Politics, um, what would those be? Well, I think uh, what's fundamental is uh, Joseph Tainter's The Collapse of Complex Societies, because he lays out the mechanisms of how collapse happens. Uh, basically, as societies get more complex, the maintenance costs go up more rapidly than the productivity of the society, and that continues until the complexity is beyond repair. He also adds in that the problem is that the elites in a society own the infrastructure. That's why they are the elites. And when the infrastructure gets in trouble, instead of trying to repair it, they work it to uh, pull wealth out, wealth out uh, hastening the collapse of the society. Uh, I think we can see those things going on now. Uh, the, the, the fall of the Roman Empire is just an amazing story. Uh, I'm reading it in parallel to uh, Toynbee's uh, study of history which is a study of the uh, fates of the 23 known societies that he can identify. Uh, what Toynbee gets is the dynamics of large populations interacting with each other. What uh, the decline and what Gibbon's decline and fall does is talk about the interpersonal relations among the leadership uh, across generations. And the three together make an incredible read. Uh, I would hardly, I mean, part of the problem is that we're getting such a, an outflow, a tsunami of writing, that it's hard to know what to focus on. We're all reading different things and not talking with each other about what we're reading. Uh, hence this call, by the by. And it's not just books and reading, it's all this other media that has larger reach than the books ever got. Yeah, and I don't know how well we're doing with this call. I, I have my questions about it. Um, how might we improve it? Well, a narrower focus on collapse in its literature, 
but so many comments are straying far afield. Well, we I mean, that's essential. This could also be call number one in a short series where we do that, where we like slow things down and go a little deeper. Um, and some of these things, like the books you just described, kind of beg for systems modeling and things like that. And I'm, I'm relatively sure that somebody out there who understands systems modeling has tried to do the modeling of the collapse of civilizations in different ways. That would be interesting to see. Um, there's, there's, you know, this is an well, endless. Th those endless books are research. by themselves modeling very serious modeling efforts. Mm -hmm. Exactly, except they're, they're prose on, on pages on dead trees. I'm really interested in looking at the models because some of the, some of the people who've done really brilliant models were wrong about some of the logics or some of their assumptions were proven wrong later by whatever. I mean, uh, techno-utopians would say, yeah, 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 those assumptions are all wrong because we can, we can fix this with science, which I'm very skeptical of. But, but they're, these things are not poured in concrete, at least not in my head. Um, Stuart. Uh, yeah, one of the things that um, Meg does in her book, because she's a systems theorist, is she takes Tainter's um, observations about collapse of systems and literally, literally looks at the U.S. and, and the world and talks about how um, we are just um, there in every single point that he articulates. Um, and to you, Ken, that would be the grounding or evidence in some ways of 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 um, uh, of her her current thesis. Um, is anyone else having trouble with? Uh, their chat when anybody screen shares, in particular me, as Michael is, is talking about in the chat? Because that's a new one to me. I've never had that problem. It, it that... goes full screen, um, instantly takes over everything, and then all I do is hit escape, and it puts it right back down to a little window. I've been doing oh. that for years. And you are using Zoom in full screen, is that correct? I am using Zoom in, in a small window on a Macintosh. That's very and... weird. And what happens is as soon as someone screen shares, and it doesn't matter if it's on this call or another call, it instantly goes full window. And I just reflexively hit escape after doing this for about three years. So would anybody please take over the screen and screen share? Because I'm quite sure that my uh, my screen will only, the screen share will only happen inside of the, the limited window where I'm watching all of you right now in gallery view. Yeah, so Ken just shared screen. I see the, your thumbnails on the right. My chat is intact on the right. The, the screen share is on the left. Uh, I, uh, I, same I, for me, it did not change the window. Uh, so what, what I usually have to do now is uh, get rid of the chat so that I can get larger who whatever somebody is screen sharing so I can read text. But I, it's my choice to turn the chat on and off. Yeah, my and chat disappeared. And I don't know, I mean, what, what Scott was saying happened for me just now where um, the, when the screen share happened, was it, was it Ken who was sharing? Um, yeah. When the screen share happened, uh, initially I saw the larger screen share with still, um, thumbnails of everybody next to it, but without me touching my screen or mouse or anything, it then went to full screen, squeezing the chat off. But now that I'm the escape trick, I know how to get out of it. I'll, I'll, I'll use that in the future, but it does do that. But I have a feeling it's a setting on your system or on your Zoom that's that's happening because mine never goes full screen and then comes back. Are you on a Mac, a PC, or a? I'm Mac? on a Mac. Um, I, Jerry, I I think it may be that it's usually you that are sharing, certainly in these calls. So it doesn't happen for you, but it would happen for others that it happens to. But I'll, I'll now that I have the escape key, I'll I'll know to do that. Yeah, but this is why I'm asking everybody if, if this is a common problem, because I've never had that happen. Um, so it's a... I've been getting it just the last week or so. It's when people stop sharing. Zoom goes to one third. The, it goes to like the middle third of the screen and stuff. Or it's weird, but okay. uh, I, will, I will be mindful. I asked week or so so it must have been like something with their last up uh, their last upgrade 
I'm Thanks. on a map. Yeah. Well, that's a mystery. It's a <clears throat> it's a mystery wrapped in an enigma. Um, and we will keep an eye on it. And I I will send a I will raise a red flag when I'm about to do a screen share so that you can mind your chat. I don't want to blow away stuff you're trying to note take. That's for sure. Um, I do not lose anything in the chat. I've been in the middle of typing. You've screen shared. It pops up um, when it goes back. Whatever I was typing is still there. I don't lose it. So I you know it does come back for me. But the screen share does go full screen for you, can it? It, it does. Okay. Even if I'm in a different application, it it interrupts and just pops over. Them, so suddenly it's there. So, so mine doesn't do that. Why is that? My well, screen share electrons. My screen share is only within the constrained window, and I have I have Zoom not full screened because that's why I asked if if you guys are full screening Zoom, because if you have Zoom set to full screen, then whenever somebody screen shares, it probably will pop to full screen. If you make Zoom a window slightly smaller than your full screen, which is what I do, that might change it. I don't know. But if you're in full screen, if, if you've got the little green button clicked and you've gone full screen in Zoom, that might be a piece of it. I'm not in full screen. Huh. Just to, to clarify, Jerry, also, this is not the only call that that happens on. Yeah. And, so, it, it, so I, and it happened It happened when Ken just screen shared? No. No, which, which was interesting. That was fine. So. Funky. So I'm going to three when Enigma. <laughs> Let me screen share for a second and see if it uh, destroys everybody's screens. How's that? Chat is gone. Chat's gone. Damn. Okay, I'm gonna see if Zoom has any trouble, any uh, any fixes for this. Well, maybe it's only when the person leading the call does it to take attention away from people writing in the chat so that the leader has the attention. If it Which, happens on other calls only when that would be terrible user interface design. I would like I would I would definitely not that doesn't mean it's not the case. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Um, anyway, if, if anybody uh, finds any hints on that, let us know next week. Um, Ken is this uh, Judy, you want to talk, but you're also having breakfast or lunch. Go ahead, you're muted. Just that on when I'm watching on a tablet, if you if I were if you were only getting a partial of the screen share, I wouldn't be able to read it. So it may be uh, something to consider in terms of the size of the screen you're using. Cool. Thank you. Um, and Ken has a poem and has asked me to screen share something uh, while he reads the poem <laughs> immediately after this conversation about how my screen sharing is annoying. Uh, perfect timing but hey i i'm nothing if not amenable to going along with that uh, so why don't i do the screen share and the fact that we can't chat will be a plus now because we have to be mindful and pay attention to the poem all right i am returning once again to um one of my favorite poets uh vistava zimborska this is called bruegel's two monkeys which is the painting you see on the screen before you this is what I see in my dreams about final exams. Two monkeys chained to the floor sit on the windowsill. The sky behind them flutters. The sea is taking its bath. The exam is history of mankind. I stammer and hedge. One monkey stares and listens with mocking disdain. The other seems to be dreaming away but when it's clear i don't know what to say he prompts me with a gentle clinking of his chain Ooh. thank you so much <clears throat> love that and Stuart has a poem as well which is relevant to the conversation we would love to hear it uh you're muted though Thank you. Uh, excited to read the poem. Um, <laughs> it's called Mission, all right? And I think it addresses some of the underlying um, choices about what it is that we're doing, each one of us individually on the planet uh, at this point in time. Mission, your purpose, vision, mission, there yet or indecision. A plan, a time of birth, for your life on earth. <clears throat> Each has noble work 
from that discover worth. Engage with clear intention, life in another dimension. Discover what's inside, flight plan waiting to guide. Sits dormant till awake, when engaged, fills your plate. Time digs at your core, find what you're here for. More clarity with each decision, trust answers and revision. Distractions of many forms, look inside for your norms. Keep peeling, paring detail, ears open, read the email. When keys arrive for bliss, unlock with a kiss. Live with purpose and a vision, honor dreamscape of your mission. Thank you. Um, if anybody would, would like to put a ribbon on the call after those two poems, please do. If not, maybe we wrap this call and I would ask that we consider how to improve this conversation. I think we should come back to this conversation. This is a lovely topic we've opened. Uh, let's see how we can improve the online resources. Uh, let's see how we can talk through this so that we sink deeper into a particular piece of it. Doug, if you want to help us frame like the, like a conversation around civilizational collapse and how it happens, maybe com a comparison of a couple models from from uh, different you know different people's perspectives. Uh, Jared Diamond wrote a book titled Collapse. There's a couple you know, collapse is uh, unfortunately a a good genre. Uh, of, of literature. Um, so maybe something like that. But uh, let's talk on the matter most or on the, on the OGM list. Uh, anybody with anything else? Any other thoughts? Yeah, no, since you just, mentioned... Go ahead, Stuart. No, I was just going to, I was just going to punctuate what you said, Jerry, about, you know, with all of the tilting at windmills and machinations and many conversations over the years, <clears throat> I think this this conversation is, is the essence of where we we seem to be right now. It's a critical conversation, um, and if you're in in some ways, it's going to sound a little arrogant, maybe. But if you're not in this conversation, get your head out of your butt. <laughs> it's where it's where we are. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. I think what Stacy was reporting to us is that it's hard even to get to this conversation. <clears throat> Um, it's, it's just hard to open the topic, hard to get to a place where you can have have these things go by. Uh, Ken? Um, when I took my coaching course, they assigned me a media fast, which was really unfair because they gave me 10 books and said you can't read them. But when I oh. broke my fast, yeah, I know it was terrible. When I broke my fast after six months, the first book I had to read was Irving Ulom's Existential Psychotherapy. And I seem to remember talking about this recently. I don't know if it was on this call or not, but Basically, he says, you know, there are times in people's lives, usually when there's someone near to them dies, where an existential door opens and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my God, we got to face this. But very few people can dwell in that space for very long. It's just too much. And now we are all facing this huge existential crisis. And I think that's I, I don't blame people for denial. I don't blame people for running away. It's really, really tough. And. Micah's uh, newsletter yesterday talking about uh, Andrew Boyd's book, you know, interviewed Joanna Macy and said, people don't want facts. They want hope. They will get there. We're emotionally driven creatures. And when you said Jared Diamond's book on collapse, I tried to read that and I got so depressed. I was like, I need some freaking cyanide here, you know, take <laughs> me out of this. I can't take it. And the same thing with Endgame. Well, what's the guy's name who wrote Endgame? Um, He's out here and, and uh, there's some books out there about collapse that are just, they're such downers. And I'm not saying that it's, there aren't things to be very upset about and, and concerned about. And there are real existential things here, but personally, I can't read people whose, whose um, premise is that we're all doomed. And all you can do is, you know, hope for, for clawing onto some level of survival. I need a little bit more, um, Hey, you know, we may be we may be going down on the Titanic, but at least we're listening to good music and drinking good, good wine or something. You know, there's got to be some kind of, even though it's terrible, you can still enjoy every moment. You can still find things to smile about. You can still, you know, live a very full life and do your best and know that it will not be enough. But as the Torah says, you're not expected to complete the work, but you're not allowed to shirk it either. Uh, Derek Jensen. Yes, that's the man. He's just, God, if you want to kill yourself, 
but you don't have the courage start to read that book you'll find the courage <laughs> damn um okay okay somebody needs to say something on a slightly funny note or talk about puppies and kittens just for a moment because i can't end on derek jensen <laughs> as, a, as a cue to suicide mr morin please so i i wrote it in the chat but i'm gonna say i think it was kevin was talking about some story about trying to get uh, announcements through the government to the people who need them and that sort of thing. And it just reminded me of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where Earth is destroyed to make way for a new hyperspace bypass. And everyone on Earth hears the announcement 10 minutes before it happens. And they said, look, we followed all the procedures. We posted it on the bulletin board several light years away. You guys have to take an interest in your, in your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so that always made me chuckle. But I love that. Um, and, yeah, the answers are in science fiction. <laughs> Adams's advice to writers <laughs> later was never never destroy the earth in the first page of your novel. <laughs> uh, I posted a link. Somebody actually tested Stephen Wright's thing about putting a humidifier and dehumidifier in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I think I think that was a per the perfect note to wrap our call. Thank you very much for your patience and contributions. Uh, see you on the intertubes. Thank you. Bye.